on with that. Okay, great. So, Real Talk Family Life, take two. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Um, that's one of the our our program and how we just are able to just free flow. But tonight we're discussing time management. We're into another episode of Real Talk Family Life, building Shatapu families one brick at a time. We're happy to have you. We're happy to engage this program, which is facilitated and produced by our host ministry out of Trinidad and Tobago Faith Tabernacle. We wanna, you know, just welcome each and every one of you, all the ministers joining us tonight. We look forward to engaging you in the next hour and a half on time. So this week's program, we're focusing on time management. We have some exceptional panelists here tonight and they will talk about the way in which building a legacy and living out purpose is facilitated by proper time management. So we encourage each and every one of you to interact with us tonight, make, um, engage the chat, show your emojis, give a thumbs up, comment if there's anything that resonates with you, something that's unclear, if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you tonight. So without further ado, let me introduce our panelists, Mr. David Andrew from Grenada. He's no stranger to Real Talk Family Life. He's a counseling psychologist with a passion to just show God's glory in everything that he does. David, give us a wave. Good night, also everybody. Have <laughs> it's really good to be with you again tonight to discuss a very important and ever-present issue, time, and how we manage it. Look forward to an exciting engagement this evening. Fantastic. Next, we have Reverend Dr. Roger Samuel, who is a counselor, pastor, and traumatologist. Very shy person, but he has a lot to share with us tonight. He's another household name on the program. So, Rev, say hello, say hi. Hi, hi, hi. Looking forward to this wonderful program. <laughs> Lovely. And tonight we have a specially invited guest, a friend of mine, Mrs. Rachel Thomas, who's an executive coach and financial consultant. Now, Rachel has done a lot of work as it relates to time management, not just for her, her clients, but for her friends. And I'm hoping she doesn't out me tonight on this program. If she does, I'll have my shame face on, but I'm also here to learn. Rachel, welcome. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. I will try not to out you or myself um, <laughs> tonight, um, but I hope you enjoy this session and that you get some really good nuggets to take away. Um, I would just encourage you, even if it's just one or two, that is perfectly fine. It doesn't have to be every single thing, but you know, just embrace the time that we have and try to try to when you're making your notes be intentional about making them and, and taking away a couple points that you can actually work with great and of course we want to acknowledge pastor anthony henry brainchild behind this program we are also inviting him to jump in even though he does not like to, to take center stage most times we also want to acknowledge dr patricia neff another one of our panelists and um, i haven't seen sherry as yet sherry barrow but she's also um, one of the frequent panelists on this program so mindset mindsets associated with time before we even you know delve further into time management panelists um how do we examine mindsets associated with time? How do we how do we start thinking about time with our busy schedules? It's amazing that we're in the midst of a pandemic, but people still find themselves very busy. You know, and my, Michael Althusser, he's a motivational speaker and business consultant. He often says the bad news is time flies, but the good news is you're the pilot. Not many people adopt this mindset. So panelists, are we victims of time? And what traditional mindsets do we adhere to that make us victims? I don't have enough time. <laughs> time is money. I'm too busy. I can't get enough out of the day. Uh, I'm running out of time. As people kept, you know, and they associate their time only with money most of the time. That if they don't have enough, if they think that they're wasting time, if they're not making money because their time is always like, I'm wasting time because I could be making some, you know, some money instead of spending this time with you. So I think it's a lot of association with money only and not having enough time to complete tasks or assignments and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. 
David, Rachel? So what I would say is um, those phrases, first of all, we kind of have to step back and observe ourselves because sometimes we're not even aware of the things that we say about time. You know, if you watch your conversation, somebody say, how are you? Or how was your day? Oh God, it was so busy. It was just, oh, you know, I can, I can hardly ever, you know, get enough. There's never enough time in the day. And those phrases, um, as everyone was just saying, what I would also say in terms of being a victim to time is to look at it as well as at being the if being the effect of um so you're you're the effect of this scenario you are a victim to or you're at the effect of time it's like there's nothing i can do about it i'm at the effect of it i am a victim to it and the energy that we put around things is also very important in terms of how um, we can direct things in our life so you know i'm going to give a bit of an example here in terms of being a victim to time you start to first of all observe what you say about time because sometimes we don't even realize what we are saying about time yeah. and our, our inherent beliefs on time and when you start to watch your speech about time you you start to realize oh I may be actually a victim to time I may be putting myself in that frame of mind of that I'm helpless to time then um, but one thing that tends to shift and or can sometimes shatter us is when something comes up that you have to find the time and so time and money are closely related because those are the two things that we find excuses for yeah well i don't make enough there's never i don't i you know i can't do mornings you can't do mornings if you had a family member that was sick and you had to get up at four o'clock for whatever reason to tend to this person you can do it and so it's your motivation around it it's your uh, mindset around it it's your perspective on it but I can guarantee you when something significant happens <laughs> those those things that you may have said before definitely shift very quickly in terms of what you can and cannot do um, regarding time David add a little bit and thank you for the opportunity and thanks to my colleagues who've gone before um when we consider all of the things said your language concerning time sure. and your orientation towards time uh, there can be several underlying motives behind how you speak about time and sometimes it's all in a view to um consider the quantity of work done the volume of work done and all of these things it comes with a kind of productivity based mindset so you always want to produce you need to produce you must produce and sometimes what you're producing needs to be brought into question that's another slant to it but there is the mindset that i just must be on the go because there's a productivity quantity oriented kind of mindset to your utilization of time whereas there could be the other um slant of mindset that has to do with the quality of work completed. So it's not necessarily the volume as much as it is the quality. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it well. If, if I'm going to touch it, I'm going to touch it properly and make sure the time spent is well spent. All of these elements come into the mindset that we have concerning time and time management and how we use it and how we relate to it and whether we turn out to be victims of it or um, we see ourselves in a never ending circle chasing after time like a puppy is stale. All of these things come in as we consider the mindset associated with time management. One yeah. thing I would add, David, just quickly, is that it, that is such a powerful thing that you said as well. And, you know, sometimes if you think back on when you're trying to, let's say you're trying to complete a task and you're under pressure, you feel like, gosh, there isn't, I, I don't have enough time for this. If you sometimes would just take a moment, go have a shower, <laughs> walk away from it, go take a 20 minute nap you would perform, you would get through so much better, as David is saying, in terms of productivity. So it's not necessarily investing so much more time you put three hours in. Um, you may come out bet way better just by taking a 15 minute nap, power nap, and coming back at it. And, and you produce something way better because you've taken that time to recharge and re-energize yourself. So I love that point. 
Yes, I do. And I, I want to follow on from that point, David, because you were making a point in the um, the warm up about people being so busy with time that oftentimes it might be that we're busy in ourselves because of some sort of deficit. And I want you to go in into that before, you know, we start thinking about the to do list and all these other things that we tend to, to write down as it relates to, to exercising time or executing responsibilities. Yeah. Thank you. I'm happy to explain that a little bit because often you hear terms like um, hurrying off to work. We always busy. Some people actually feel a, a, a really deep sense of importance as it relates to work. And not that work is not important because apart from the economic benefit that work dignified work brings to human beings, it does bring psychological benefit. Yeah. To be involved. So there is a good place for the benefit associated with work. But sometimes people escape into work. They escape to work. So work becomes an escape point. They are actually hiding behind stuff. They're probably running from um, situations that are more difficult to deal with that they'd rather not deal with. So before I talk to my spouse at home uh, and deal with that difficult stuff, I'm just going to stay at work and come home 10 o'clock. In the, in the night when I'm home, it's just time to sleep. Um, I don't deal with this when I get up in the morning, half an hour and I'm out the door. Um, so sometimes it's a way of escaping from your real self and the things, some of the things that are troubling you. Sometimes it's some deficit, sometimes it's relational, sometimes it's people, sometimes it's uh, circumstances and consequences that you don't want to engage because there's a sense that um, I really can't control them. The reality is, we get, we get a sense of accomplishment quite easily when we tend to manage and manipulate the successes at work. So we get this achievement, we get this monthly accolade, we get that, and that does a lot positively for our brain chemistry. So we feel good, we wanna live there. We're the CEO, we're entitled to this, we, we have positions. But then when it comes home, when it comes to those issues, we struggle. And here's where we should have had the real control because today, tomorrow, they can change work circumstances, but your life remains uh, what you have control over. And so the more we try to manage that, the less we feel the impulse to escape to work, to escape from whatever it is to work in an attempt to um, compensate for some deficit. I, I hope I've kind of talked around it just a little bit. Yeah, and, and we're going to come back to it when we discuss, you know, how we prioritize our life, not just with work as the center, that eight to five, but work-life balance. And when we, we talk about what's important, but not urgent. So we're going to stick a pin there and just jump to the to-do list for a minute. But even though we're limited by time for this program, one hour and a half, we just really want to take time to examine three particular aspects relating to time and so we're covering mindsets and to lead into you know how we, we start looking at time differently um a lot of us have to do lists you wake up in the morning and take the kids to school go to work but I also need to make sure I pay this bill I have to do that today I need to do this later on this evening and so it's almost like we are again victims or slaves to the to-do list and if you don't have a to-do list then you're not managing your time properly is the to-do list a myth or reality? Is it a good way to manage tasks? Is it not? Um, and then what happens when our list is so long that it's almost like a mile? You know, can we become overwhelmed by the list and then in essence do nothing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Don't all jump on it. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna call Rachel. I'm going to call the new reality. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the first thing that comes to mind. The last thing that you said in terms of, do you become, you know, when you're looking at that to-do list, the overwhelm, you get this thing, which in my, in my coaching world is called analysis by paralysis. You see that list and it's a mile long. You know what? I think I'm going to do nothing because I can't even know. I don't even know where to begin. Um, I would say that I appreciate lists and planning. I think that they definitely do have their place, um, but I think they also need to be used well. And a growing list is an indication um, that something else is at bay <laughs> as well to me in the sense that, okay, why is it keep growing? Um, and you know, what is not happening then? 
wh why is this list expanding so much? And there could be a couple of reasons. One is, which we may get more into detail later, is setting boundaries. So we're saying yes to everything. Can you do this? Yep. Can you do that? Yep. Yep. Even if you don't necessarily want to, you are automatically saying yes because maybe you're inherently a bit of a people pleaser, which there's nothing wrong with any of these things. It's learned behavior, but it, it's whether it's serving us or not um, in this expansion of this to-do list. Are you taking on more tasks than you really need to? Um, so I think while the to-do list has its place and helps with focus and helps with intention, I think you have to use it well. Um, and I have a really lovely tool that I love to apply to every to-do list. And you should all write this down. <laughs> so every time you have a list in front of you, you need to consider four things. And I call this the four Ds, D as in dog. So when you look at your list, you ask yourself, do I, do me, do me, do I personally have to do this particular item on the list? One. So do I need to do it? Do I need to do it? Secondly, can I delegate it? And delegation doesn't mean you have to hire a team. Delegating it may mean to ask a family member if they can do something for you. So let me give you an example. I have four elderly people that I take care of. One is my, I have two aunts and my mother and my father. My aunt, the youngest of the people in my family, she has a responsibility. Her responsibility is to check on the dog food because I am not running around like a lunatic trying to get dog food every time it runs out. So she has a task. I say to her, this is your responsibility. I need you to check, to top up, to order, to get it delivered and I will pay for it. But I'm not doing this because I don't have to. I'm assigning this to you. This is your job. So something simple like that because I realized that this whole dog food drama was just creating chaos in my life. And I said, I have to find a solution to this therefore somebody has to be assigned this task and so it's not about necessarily business sometimes it is family stuff that we need to consider okay how can I delegate this and who should I delegate it to how do you empower the person so that you not feel like if you're just putting something on them you ask their permission hey I need some help this dog food is becoming drama central I cannot be an emergency dog food person I need help can you help me with this and you know, how you ask sometimes is also extremely important. So that's the second thing. So first, do you have to do it? Do you absolutely have to do it? Can you delegate it? And it could be work situations. It could be personal situations. It could be school situations, whatever. The third D is to dismiss. Does this even belong on the list? Or is this a rolling thing that just really needs to come off? that has no weight, no importance, but it's just on the to-do list, creating a weight that is unnecessary. And that's where overwhelming comes in. Because overwhelm is when you're looking at something and this thing is just growing and you're not even assessing the things on the list. Why is this item here, first of all? So that's another consideration. Can I dismiss it? So we have do, we have delegate, we have dismiss. And the fourth one is delay. And that means... It should be on the list, but maybe I need to put timelines around these things. So if I absolutely have to do it, it's a priority. It's higher on the list. If I have to do it, but I don't have to do it this week, this goes on next week's list. And so the list then doesn't look as onerous as 50 million items. So I found this is something that I use with my clients all the time. And it is extremely effective. And it is a thing that I find as a great reminder, especially when in these times, COVID pandemic, people feel overwhelmed. And I say, what's on your list? Let's do an assessment. And we go through these, do I do this? Can I delay it? Can I delegate it? Or can I get it off the list altogether? So that's my opinion on to-do lists. <laughs> Reverend Samuel, David, anyone wants to, to jump in? Sure, I can. Now, um, we commenting on the to-do list. Um, for me,
did we did we lose David? I think he's frozen a little bit. He's frozen a bit. Okay, so while we wait on David, I'm just gonna go to comments in the chat. Um, Nehemiah says sometimes we engage in fake busy as a way of making ourselves feel important or relevant part of a busy society. Busy equals productive. Um, and, you know, I, I tend to agree with that because it's almost like we wear, we're wearing our burnout on our sleeve. I saw something on Instagram the other day, you know, that says people wear, walk around wearing their burnout as a badge of honor, but mm -hmm. that's not the life that we're meant to live, you know? And so tonight, if, if you feel like you're wearing burnout and maybe not even as a badge of honor, but you're just tired, rest assured that there is a different way of doing it and just you know, while we still wait on David, I'm just going to reiterate what Rachel said. Do you have to do it? Can you delegate it? Does it even belong on this list? Is it something that needs dismissing? Or can you delay it by setting timelines? So again, we're discussing mindsets around time management, but we're also offering solutions, um, different options that you can choose and that you can try out to improve the way you live your day-to-day -day life. And not again, not just the wrong work but against family around self-care so while we're on the topic of self-care um david got knocked off we'll wait for him to come back are there any questions um so far reverend samuel do you want to add anything on um the to-do list before we move on no no I, mean, I think she outlined it pretty well and 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 and, and, and gave us all the objectives that i think is, is necessary especially with the fact that uh does this belong on my list, you know? Recognizing it's there, but it has no significance to my you know, productivity. It's just there because it's things I just find myself doing, not assessing whether it's important, you know, what is necessary. So I like that in identifying, does this belong? And sometimes if we take time to go through our list, sometimes we add things just because we're just used to doing things but it's not necessarily at this particular time. That is so true. And it's so funny that you say that um, because I was I was talking to my mother the other day. Um, my mother recently had a procedure and she's supposed to be resting, right? And it's almost like rest is a foreign word. And so she's clean, the house is clean, it looks tidy. I think you could even eat the food off the ground. But she says to us, oh, the cupboards look a little sticky. So I'm going to clean the front of the cupboards I feel like like do you even need to do this right so Naimaya says to do or not to do mommy to do or not to do so again keep your comments coming in the chat um we love the fact that you're engaging send us your questions if anything is unclear let's talk about Tinker and Time so if you've ever watched a Disney movie you'd know of Tinkerbell and the Tinkers right they find loose objects they make things out of it and they they help to make tasks a lot easier and so the question becomes can we do that with our time Abraham Lincoln says nothing valuable can be lost by taking time. So we have these long to-do lists. We're wearing our burnout on our sleeve. We need to change something about it. My question to you, is it about self-control? Rachel just says we can just said we can delegate tasks. What would you advise participants about managing their time? If you can say one thing tonight to participants about managing time, what would that be? I would say it really has to do um, because my understanding was your previous session was about legacy mm -hmm. and so everybody's um, use of time is going to be different I love what David said about you know filling time I am guilty very much so I I can't say I was a workaholic I, I was a workaholic I mean my days would would sometimes start at 8 30 and by nine ten o'clock at night I'm still there um so that is a, a a inherent of my a bit of my profession and the expectation from the finance world but also it became very habitual and you realize oh I've burnt out my adrenals how wonderful now I have to try and correct this um so I think that that's critical um but 
I think the other the other side is is to focus on well if you're if you're not sure about purpose but you know however you framed legacy the the thing that is going to drive where and how you spend your time is when you define what is valuable to you what your values are what is important to you what um, guides your purpose and your legacy and and then you go from there. So let me just see if, if, if an example will help. Let's say that family is one of my um, high priorities. It's one of my values. Um, then that's one of the things that you're going to factor in, in terms of how you spend your time. So that's going to be when you look at your schedule and you have a blank schedule, because family is such a, a huge thing, you're going to be designing your time to incorporate a, a good element from in terms of spending time with family or what that means for you. If you say that and you look at your schedule and your schedule is all work, then how true is are your words when it says, oh, when you say, oh, my value, I, I value family, you know, very highly. But when we look at your schedule, that's not what happens. So I think you almost have to step back in terms of time and, and reassess and say, okay, first of all, what is important to me? Where am I heading? Where is my compass fixed? What direction am I going in? And then start to assess where am I spending my time? So to give you another example, I, I was, I am in the finance arena, but to become a coach, it didn't, it wasn't something that I was just like a whim or fancy, fancy for me. I, I felt really quite, um, I don't want to say lost. I, I just felt like I was underutilized. Um, I felt like I wasn't using all of my strengths and I felt like something was missing. And so that sent me on a search to figure out what what is missing? What, what is necessary in my life that would be fulfilling and that could enhance me? Um, and so I then started to invest quite a bit of time in my own personal growth um, and that became important. So, you know, where I would before say I'm not a morning person. Um, yeah, that became really important. So becoming a morning person meant was became particular for me to get up at five o'clock or four o'clock or whatever it took for me to discover some of those elements that, you know, put me on the path to becoming an executive coach, which is an absolute passion of mine. Um, but I, it took me a while. I didn't realize I couldn't have come out and said, yeah, I want to be a coach. I, it was a journey, but it was, it meant me starting and focusing on my personal development journey. Um, and so, you know, as, as things change in your life, th other, other things get more prioritized. So I got married clearly. I need to spend time. Family is important to me. So I do want to spend time with my husband because I have the tendency to be a very academic or <laughs> personal growth driven person. So I could do that all day and all night, but I'm also a, make a conscious effort that I do enjoy the time. I want to spend the time with my, with my family. So I think those are just some examples of why I think if there was anything to say, then it has to be time has to be based on legacy purpose, um, values and intention. Rev, what would you advise participants about managing their time? Well, one of the things I could think about, uh, I think I read somewhere a long time ago that time is a passing of life. So whatever you give your time to, you're giving your life to. So in, 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 in agreement with Rachel, I mean, when you understand where you are and what is required at the particular time, because some things, you know, we might deem as important, but it's not important at that particular time. So I think it's, it's, it's starting to manage you, manage self, because sometimes we try to manage time and we are out of control, you know, we're not sure of where we are, what we need, what is important at this time. So I think once we start managing our lives and managing self, it, it, it gives us some idea of what to give ourselves to and to what extent and what percentage of our time should be given over to this or to that. Is it productive? Is it adding it to what I want it to do later on? Or is it just satisfying me now, but not putting things in place 
for long-term success and long-term development that I can have, uh, um, I can enjoy a, you know, a better quality of life because the time and the thing I'm investing, you know, my time with now. So I think it's a lot to do with managing self and understanding where you are and what is required at that time and also managing focus because, you know, what should be my focus at this time? Yeah, and um, what should I be thinking about? Because we could like, you know, usually the first of the year or the first couple or the last days of December, we're planning and we have this, you know, new year resolution of the list of things we, you know, we want to do and we, and we want to change. And so sometimes we plan or, or think about our future, not based on what's needed now or what our destiny is, our purpose is. Sometimes we keep comparing our lives to what others have and we think we are missing. Mm -hmm. So we plan around what we think we need to get based on what they have. Not trying to understand you know, what I'm destined for, what is my purpose, what should I be doing now? And later on, I perhaps I can enjoy some of those things, but right now is a time for investing, it's time for adding value, it's time for development. And you know, because sometimes, you know, you could be a teenager and, 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 and you fall in love or think love is so important at that time and you just get caught up in the whole emotions and not knowing nothing is wrong with love and being loved. But at that time, that is not what you need. You know, what you need now is to develop yourself, focus on education so that down the road, you can enjoy those type of things. So I think it's learning it to manage you, where you are, your emotions and your focus and what is needed at that time. Yeah, I, I like the points that you're making and I'm also gonna refer to COVID, right? So this program started as a response to COVID and keeping people connected, et cetera. Now we're not going out to work. So we're not doing the nine to five in the traditional sense. You're working from home. And you know, very few companies before COVID thought about production as in get the work done, meeting these deadlines outside of being at work for 15 hours a day right? You, you had to be at your desk in order to, for work to get done. Now we're in COVID where you, you're able to work from a laptop. And, and Rachel, I'm coming back to you. I see David is back with us. Um, when, in terms of, um, I think his name is Ed, and he was talking about the concept of three days in one. And so what COVID has offered us an opportunity to rejig how we manage our time. So Rachel, if you can, if you can just talk about that for, um, for us. So, okay, sure. There are a couple, well, this is one that I just found interesting at the time I heard it um, in terms of, of how you can manage time a little differently or, or I like how um, Dr. Samuel put it in terms of managing yourself <laughs> um, more than trying to corral time into... <laughs> Um, so there's this guy called Ed, um, Mylett, M-Y-L-E-T-T. -T. He had this very interesting concept about, um, you know, he's, he's talking about very driven, very successful people and kind of how they frame time. And he had this methodology about taking one day and breaking it into three. So you create shorter segments. So in other words, like 6 a.m. to 12 is they consider that a day. And if you if you if you thought about 6 a.m. to 12 as a day, what would you how would you structure it? And it's not to necessarily become a workaholic because he's talking about structuring everything. So you end up now with instead of seven days a week, you have 21 days a week. And now time has, a t it, it's almost like twisting your brain in terms of how you can look at time. I've tried it um, and I thought it was really cool because you're at the end of every day, what he also said is that you do a reflection. So it's a good thing that throughout the day, so at midday now you take a, a moment to see, okay, how, how has day number one out of three gone <laughs> today? And you can then tweak your intention and your focus for day number two, even though you're in the same day. But it also means about, you know, where you spend your time. Maybe you spend the morning time doing um, more work-related tasks, obviously dependent on, you know, what you're doing and how, how you're getting it done. And then the evening time may be more family time. 
but you're so much more intentional about how you're structuring that day and getting so much more out of the day that it has a, a, a what they call a compound effect. So it's like a three day in one, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, the other thing that I would offer, which I found really powerful is to, you know, when you look at that to-do list and you feel totally overwhelmed, what you could do is take task and set a time to it. So for example, let's say you decide you're gonna do whatever and you're gonna allocate an hour to it. You take your phone and you set an hour and you know you're working on this task. So you're focused for one hour on this task. Sometimes if you have a task and you think you have to spend six hours on it, that in itself kind of turns you off. But for one hour, you're gonna sit down and focus and see how far you get through this task. What I find that does is that when you set your timer for an hour, the distractions that may have come up before, um, you are more likely to put that aside. So let's say you're, you've started your hour, you're 15 minutes in and the phone rings, it's whoever. You're like, I can't talk right now, I'll call you back at midday because you know that you're focused on that hour on this specific task and it breaks it down into smaller chunks for you to work with. So you may take a five minute or 10 minute breather after that first hour and then reset and do another hour. But you're chunking your day or your you know, task down into smaller segments that could be more manageable and you're more apt to focus in and not getting distracted. So those are two things that I could offer. Okay, um, we wanna open the conversation up to the participants. So if anyone has a question, a query, a comment, feel free to raise your hand so that we can see. Yes, Vivek, go ahead. Good evening. Okay, I've listened to the panelists and um, our last speaker, Ms. Um, Rachel, Rachel. And while I agree that there has to be structure in your day, and I'm just, I just want to go back to something that you mentioned, that if you have a task to do and you have... Um, you say you've set one hour or whatever the time may be to accomplish that task. If a phone call comes in, then you will not take that call because you want to finish that. But sometimes, as I said before, uh, we, there must be structure. Sometimes don't you think when we do things like that, we become very regimental. And also, you know, maybe within that time, somebody might need to, it might be, somebody might be in a serious problem and they really need somebody to, to talk to them but because we are so focused on getting this thing done and, and, and don't get me wrong I'm not saying that you're not to be focused on getting things done and we're not to have structure or anything like that but we don't want to become so regimental that you know this is um you know if anybody call I'm going to block them out and, and maybe sometimes you have to do that I'm not saying no but we I guess we have to be very careful that we don't become so regimental but structure is required <laughs> I totally agree with you. And what I would say too is that it's 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 two sides of it. One is also, you know, what aligns with you as well. Obviously, somebody calling that is uh, you know, there's they're in a situation, you you may have to stop and deal with it at that point in time. Um, however, if you notice that um you're I guess this is where it comes to looking at your time, if if you get a lot of distractions or a lot of phone calls, it's then determining, okay, which one do I need to action versus which one do I need to say, okay, I can't talk to you right now because then you're out of alignment if you're going to just say, okay, sorry, I don't care what your problem is. I don't care what's happening here. Well, I got to get this task done. And I don't think it's, I agree with you. It's not necessarily to create so much structure and regimen that you now ignore every facet of life. Um, but at the same time, it's also to notice, okay, Am I taking distracting phone calls um, or am I paying attention to what, you know, it's staying in tune then. Does this align with me? Is this something that um, should be dealt with right now? And then you can pause after and rejig your day, but it still helps you maintain focus in terms of what you want to achieve. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to say, oh, well, I wanted to spend time with my family, but, you know, I had these three calls and I really had to deal with that. So now I've gotten no family time. You know, it's really hard, fi hard to find time to spend with family. Um, but yet two of those three phone calls, you could probably have delayed to another time. 
I have found, yeah. if I may say, I have found that sometimes um, people, you can get caught up being pulled into what is important to people. And your life is spent fulfilling what's important to them, but not always what's important to you or your assignment. So you must know what is your assignment and the thing that you have to get done. Because in my life, there are always someone with a need, there's always someone with a situation, and to everyone, their issue is an emergency. And they come to you like that, and if you're not careful, you can be pulled into doing what's important to them. And at the end of the day, there's no fulfillment. You're just involved in life, but have no fulfillment in your involvement. And you pull into their stuff. So it's, it's really striking a balance, like you said, you know, Rachel, of course, we, we no. We can be too resonant, but we must know what we are about, where we're heading, what we can tolerate, what we can engage with, how much we can give our time to and when and if. And then we apply all, all the things that you said before. We can delegate. Can someone else take care of that? If not, we are pulled into their importance for the rest of our lives. And then we are most miserable after we've done a good job. We are most miserable. Mm -hmm because they're happy and be happy to do it. But we're frustrated that our stuff is still not done. I, I so, love that. I love yeah. that, Pastor Samuel. I'm gonna let you finish, but I'm just, I just wanna prepare David because I think this is an adequate time to talk about Stephen Covey's four quadrants, right? Um, I had a lecturer who, when it was time to, to, to wrap up the PhD research and do your thesis, she would say, I know y'all are working and I know y'all have jobs, but understand that no is a complete sentence. And so it's not so much about being insensitive to other people's needs, but like you said, um, Rev, that you have to know what legacy it is you're trying to create, what purpose is driving you at any given point in time. And so you need to compartmentalize what's important, what's urgent to you, what you need to get done first. So Rev, I'm gonna let you finish, but David, I just wanted to prep you that this is the opportune time to speak about Stephen Covey's four quadrants in terms of time management. Go ahead, Rev. And then I see your hand, Bevon. Yeah, no, no, no but I'm really finished because really that's what it is. It's just knowing, and just echo what you said. Yes, on the book a legacy and what I'm about, what is my assignment, and my whole concept of life and helping people and what that means and knowing, like Rachel said, where to set those boundaries. And people come in your life sometimes to break and to test those boundaries. Mm -hmm. And if you are caught up, because as Christians, you know, we're easily moved and we're ready to give everything we have. And, 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 and we should, but we have to know. Okay, I'll give you this one story and I'm finished, yeah? There was this guy who was given an assignment to, um, to watch a white house, a lighthouse. And he was given four gallon of oil to take care of that lighthouse. And of course, um, it gives light to the ship is coming in with cargo and other stuff. And four persons came with legitimate needs and said, you know, my mother knew this and something knew that. And he gave away the four gallon of oil that was given to him to maintain the light in the lighthouse. When the owner came back, because of course the light went dim because no maintenance and all the ship was coming in with the cargo was lost, things went in a different direction. So when the owner came and said, what happened? I gave you enough oil or fuel to take up the lighthouse. Why is, you know, as the lighthouse gone dim and, and you couldn't give direction to the ship in the ocean, cargo was lost. He said, well, you know, these four different persons came with legitimate needs. And I just gave them to those persons. Well, how, but the moral of the story is this. Even though their needs were legitimate, the oil had a specific assignment. And if you do with the oil what it was not assigned it to do, you are in trouble. None of those, those needs could not have been met, but just not by you at that time with what was given for something else. Okay, I see Rachel wants to add before we Just go to- two seconds, because I think it is such a, a, a hugely important point that, um, you know, sometimes that gift and that heart is, is amazing, except 
it can it can also turn and be depleted and then we start to you know we also need to assess you know how we feel about the situation at if we tend to be that type of person that is you know able to help or being helpful that's that's awesome there's nothing wrong with that but you have to set your boundaries and you have to set your boundaries also to remain to, to sasha's point who kind of alluded to self-care you can't expend all of you because you then become depleted and so you you're unable to be all that you can be if you're just giving all of you away to others there there are parameters that you need to set around that and i say that with with great um with a big heart and also even to give an, a, just a brief example i mentioned these lovely little people that i have around me they have a day that they have to set appointments and do whatever needs to be organized I can't give them every single day. I will show up in a heartbeat for an emergency, but you have to put structure around some things. Um, and it's not like I talk to my mother every day or whatever the case is, but certain things you have to decide, is this something that I, I have to deal with? Is this in my wheelhouse um, as well? Is this something that is gonna expend so much out of me that I have nothing left for me? So I think it's a it's a really really big point that we can get caught in these situations. Yeah. Uh, right. So thank you. Um, let me apologize. I got knocked off. Couldn't get back in. Um, when I tried getting back in, error codes and then on stable internet, I had to get another device. When I got the the device rebooted, it decided to do all the updates. So that's going to take a whole long time. So anyhow, but I'm back in. Now, you know, I'm, I'm listening to all of the discussions and I know I missed some, but I'm thinking, you know, it will be a tragedy to, to use time effectively and waste a life. Because, you know, sometimes we can get very proficient at seemingly managing time, but to what end is the ultimate question. And we might manage it from, from a very sound academic point of view and we just have to run the risk that we don't, we just have to make sure we don't go that route of knowing all of the little techniques, which are excellent and advisable even without having a clear vision. And Dr. Samuel, and when I came, I, I got the sense that that was a bit of the discussion going on. So we want to make sure that we don't just manage the time effectively and then waste our life in the process because it wasn't well focused, it wasn't purpose driven, it wasn't um, based on self awareness and a sense of self-direction and self-regulation and all of that. And so I just wanted to stick that in before I share. So now you've asked me to share a little bit on Stephen Covey's um, time management window. And Eisenhower the, the developed this um, quadrant, this box long ago, talking about things that were urgent and um, important. And Stephen Covey popularized it um, with the context of managing time. And so it, it's a tool that could help us understand the place of things in our lives when it concerns what gets to what degree of time. And you'd notice in that quadrant you're looking at, you see on the left of your screen, you see important and right below it, not important. So going all the way up to the top, we're talking about things that are important. We need the things that are not important going all the way across. But if you come back to the first quadrant, you're seeing important and urgent. In other words, there are some things that in our lives turn out to be pretty important and they're urgent. And here you have the kind of activities that we're talking about, crisis, um, pressing problems, emergencies. Those are deadline driven kind of stuff. Um, and these are things you have to attend to, but you have some results here, stress and burnout and crisis management, always um, putting out fires. So you're always running. These are things you have to deal with, but ideally you don't want to be living there. If you move right across to the right, you see the second quadrant. It says not urgent, but of course it's important, not urgent, but important. And that's the quadrant where 
a lot of planning takes place, a lot of preparation takes place. So we're talking about things that are not necessarily uh, an emergency at the moment, but they are important. How emergent is it to study? It's probably not an emergency right now, but it is important. How urgent is it to plan? It probably isn't life-threatening if you don't plan right now, but yes, it is important to diet, to eat well, to exercise, all of these things fall in there. And in fact, Stephen Covey says that effective people live in that quadrant. In other words, they try to operate from that quadrant. And so even as we think of managing time and we think of all the things that are important, understand that there are some things that are important. They're not urgent. We don't need to complete them at this particular time. It doesn't threaten life. But if we could operate mostly from there, we'll become a lot more effective. We're coming down to the lower left-hand side and there's a quadrant that says not important, but again, it's urgent. And Dr. Simon was speaking beautifully about it. Whose urgency are we talking about here? Sometimes things become urgent for somebody else and we can make it our urgency. It's not important to us. It's not important to our direction, to our life's purpose, to our life's calling, but we can make those things become important. They're not important, but it can be uh, they're urgent. Somebody else's urgency and we can treat with them. Um, that wouldn't be the most optimal use of our time. Right, um, And then you have the fourth quadrant of things that are neither important nor urgent. And we spend sometimes significant percentages of our time doing things in that quadrant. So for instance, let me give an example. I challenge people sometimes when I do some sharing, when I ask them to examine how they utilize their time. Lots of people will say, you know, what's important to me, a lot of the guys say, my, my family, my family is the most important. And then the moment time they get free time after work, where do they end up? On the bar, um, probably playing some dominoes. And not that there is not a place for that. But if you take a careful look at how the time is spent over a period of time, either a week, a month, whatever it is, you would see that probably the greater percentage of free time is spent in a particular place, in a particular time. In a, and that is not necessarily reflective of what is supposed to be important for an individual. So this quadrant serves to give us a careful visual of things that can be urgent, important. We must deal with those because it probably could threaten lives. But things that are not urgent but important is where we should aspire to operate from. The things that are not important but urgent, sometimes they can be delayed, depends on who, whose urgency. Um, that call can be taken sometime after, um, as um, Rachel was rightly sharing. If it's not extremely important, can that be shared to sometime later? Can't deal with it now, I'll deal with it after. And in the final quadrant, there are things, they're neither important nor urgent, and we are advised to minimize those, eliminate them if possible, as we consider which things we focus our time and our life on. So you find that kind of essence in that quadrant and the results of activities that you undertake in those, in those quadrants. You see variations of it too in terms of time you allocate from each of the quadrants and you might see a bigger amount of time being allocated for the second quadrant, quadrant two, yeah? Uh, where you spend more time there because these are the things, they're not yet urgent, but if you plan, if you prepare, you would avoid the urgencies and those things are obviously important so you'd be a lot more effective. So just for your consideration and review as you plan the things that I put and the things that you are going to invest your time in as you try to manage that with you. Sasha. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Pastor Henry. Um, Bevon, you had a question. So we're gonna take a few questions before we move on to shifting our time. Hi, good night, everyone. Um, it was a comment and a question. Um, I've listened to all that has been said thus far, and for the next four months, I can't even imagine dropping one thing off my list. So I don't. I, I am hoping there's someone out there like me who 
is already overwhelmed just thinking about the next four months because there's nothing off your list that you can drop as much as everything that is being said are some things that are you just cannot drop and so what what i found helped me is to reminding myself that it's only for four months bear in mind it's for a short period of time bear in mind you're making this sacrifice for a phase, it's not going to be forever, it's not going to be for long and to, to help have that get me through the next few months that it's going to be like that. Additionally, the next question I had is, when sometimes you have things to do and you have to, you may have to sacrifice, for example, if I have projects, I might need to sacrifice the time I might spend with the kids in the night. So how do you manage that guilt? The mom guilt, the wife guilt, when you have to make sacrifices sometimes to deal with other things that are urgent and important in, in that phase of, of the week or that time period. Okay, so I, I could shoot. <laughs> Oh, Dr. Samuel, you were going? No, 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 you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me start with the first thing. You said it's just four months, so the sacrifice of four months. And I think it's probably a useful perspective to keep in mind if you are going to pour your way through it. It's useful to know it's not a long-winded stint. But I think what needs to be considered all the time is this, the cost of that sacrifice the, because all it takes is probably one week of extreme stress and it could change one's life forever. So one has to be careful. Four months is a lot of time to do a lot of damage to the things that can be pretty important to you as a family, as an individual. And so in your assessment, you must count the, the potential for damage, for cost, for loss, um, as opposed to the sacrifice being made. Um, if that sacrifice is going to leave um, some degree of social deficit in your in your daughter or in your daughters um, for the four months, I, for me, I would be careful to make sure that the priority that I place on them is reflected in my choice then in terms of approaching the four months. So I think counting the cost of the sacrifice is a critical element in that. Yes, you value this and you value that, but if it's going to cost you something that is more significant than what the kudos you get for completion of a project or the month of the, the employee of the month award you get for completing it or the extra benefit, then you need to probably double check to make sure you're not giving up more for less. Yeah. Rev, you wanna go next? No, 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 I mean, I would just, um, you know, I'm thinking managing time also really, it's about making sacrifices, you know, in order to manage and to achieve some goals and some things. You have to make some sacrifices, understanding, you know, the um, the things you may have to live it out for a short period, for the things you want to live with for a longer period. So it is some sacrificing that is required, even in managing time, and understanding what that sacrifice is. Yes. Yeah. Rachel? I like the balance of both. I like the consideration of what is this costing me? I think that's an extremely valid point. Um, and I think that it's good to always know um, and explore what other options or choices that you may not have considered that you could tweak or adjust. Mm -hmm. I love what um, the Reverend is saying in terms of Yes, there are sometimes you do have to sacrifice. So maybe you sacrifice some sleep if you're getting up earlier. Um, but to, to weigh the pros, to, to, to look at the balance. At the end of the day, is this what is this costing me? And um, not to go down a road of um, this, this could create a habitual behavior. You don't want now where you're saying for four months um, and then the four months is five and you and you find yourself saying, I can't, I can't change this. I can't do that because you're already speaking this kind of <laughs> into existence. If you're saying I can't, you, you could say, 
what else could I do? Because sometimes you have to slow down to speed up. Sometimes you need to take a moment to just say, hold on, is there another way I could look at this? Is there, an, is there any other option? Or what if something happened and I had to make an adjustment? What would that look like? So yeah, count the yeah. costs and consider the sacrifice. I'm the balance. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Sometimes I think, I mean, even as this is a Christian audience, sometimes I think if you don't make the time to do what's important, God will, will make the time for you. And if you don't make the time for him, yeah. he sometimes makes the time for you, you know? Um, so something to think about. But what I want to do is go to the chat. It's been very active tonight. So I'll start at the bottom and work our way back up. And um, Pastor Henry says, when a person has decided in advance what their mission or legacy will be, the choice in use of time becomes easy. In, if the event does not contribute to my life's purpose, then I must say like Jesus, I must be about the purpose for which I was sent. Yep. Pastor Griffith has also been commenting throughout. Um, he has said that we will always have to make sacrifices, but sustained sacrifices might be ill-advised. So just reiterating some of the things that were mentioned. Janelle says, find at least one hour um, to, and I guess this was in response to Bevon's question, find at least one hour to spend time with those who are important to you. Um, someone who's using a Lenovo tab, you know, just drop your name in there so we can acknowledge you, said communication is important. Share your goals with those who will be impacted and get the buy-in. Um, you know, and Janelle initially said to you, Bevon, first, don't be hard on yourself. And that's good. I, I love the empathy that's coming. Um, Nehemiah, in relation to, I, I believe this is um, Dr. Samuel's analogy with the lighthouse, says failing to prepare is, fearing, is preparing to fail. So again, some of those, those things that we often see related to time and preparation, um, coming back to the full um, Dr. Neff just says excellent discussion. So that's good. I think time is always something we should be speaking about and learning how to manage it well. Pastor Griffith also made a comment that the management of time and what gets prioritized is connected to our purpose and our goals. Only some of us are so clear where we are going. And I love that. So we have a good few wisdom nuggets coming out um, that we could possibly share for the next week. Nehemiah says, I have really appreciated being able to work from home. And um, this is in relation to COVID-19 because part of my own creative process is to read a few hours of poetry before getting started. But sitting in an office nine to five, it's impossible. Now I get to work in a way that produces the best results. And I love that because it talks about not just change in mindset, but sometimes a change in space that has to take place, a change in the way we orchestrate our day and our lives. Going back to that whole concept of three days in one, Rachel, if you have the, the, the ability to restructure your day, then you tend to get more out of it and more satisfying engagements than just doing the nine to five at work. And by the time you come home, you're tired and you have to take your family family and it's almost like you're on this this wheel and this hamster wheel and you just keep doing the same things over and over again and, and it's not being fulfilled. Abigail says in managing time I think we need to be practical and not unrealistic especially with allocating timelines. Um, Nehemiah says as a creative who has an abstract mindset how do I not bore myself to death or stifle my creativity by conforming to the structure of time? So I'm going to repeat that for the panelists. As a creative, I see Rachel, who has an abstract mindset. How do I not bore myself to death or stifle my creativity by conforming to the structure of time? Over to you. No, you would not think I'm a creative because I'm a finance person, but I believe that we are all creative beings. So that's where I'll start. Um, and I think it is creating what you need in your schedule and, and, and putting that creative time in there, the time that you need that fills your cup regarding creativity. Now, whatever that looks like. For me, it may be writing content. Um, it may be well, generally it's writing, <laughs> um, but that, that fuels me. That's one of those things that I know 
is needs to be incorporated into my schedule. So while I have a bit of a, a non, well, I can't say non-creative, but work side versus creativity, um, I know that I need that in my schedule. So it's it's not, um, it, it's creating spaces or white spaces in your schedule that you know that that element of your life is definitely met and not that a schedule means no creativity. A schedule or putting spaces in there for things that fuel you doesn't, doesn't mean that creativity goes, through, goes out the door. Actually, it's being intentional about what is important to you. And if creativity is one of those things, it is blocking out so that you actually do spend the time in creativity. If not, sometimes you can feel swept away by, well, I'm not getting to do anything. At the same time, you want to have some idea about where you're spending your time as well. And so that it's not just, well, the day went by, I was creative, I, you know, I was creative or not during the day. I don't know if that's helpful. David? Yeah. Um, even, even as you spoke, the, the, the idea of flow, you know, this psychological, this optimal psychological space that people enjoy during work came to mind. And you can be a very creative person, but you can have that. You can have that um, optimal um, psychological work situation um, where you feel even lost in what you're doing. Musicians feel it a lot. Sometimes you just get lost. And this has implications even for your choice of career, um, the things you can determine to get involved in. So what if, as a, as a creative person, you find yourself employed, you choose to become employed in one of the areas where you can do that X amount of hours within your day and feel extremely fulfilled and get lost in it, then your creativity is not interfered with. In fact, it's encouraged within your regular work day. So I think all of that comes in with part of the, the self-awareness that's necessary to effectively use your time and, and apply it so that you can be in that place, in that psychological um, flow while you execute your creativity, just from your choice of occupation. And as Rachel was saying, um, just having those pockets. And even those pockets, you might see it as a structure, but the pockets allow you the flexibility to engage in whatever creative way you can once you're intentional and deliberate about it. And that serves pretty well to facilitate the creative spirit within you, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Doc? No, I'm good. You good? Okay. Um, so before we go back to the chat, um, Pastor Anthony Henry said, um, if a person can visualize their legacy, they can make choices towards managing their time. If a person can visualize their legacy, they can make choices towards managing their time. And I'm just going to go to the chat. Can you tell us about the importance of time for renewal of oneself? Some of us get so busy driving that we can't stop to take gas. And I'm going to go straight to Rachel on this one. <laughs> Thanks, Sasha. <laughs> um, this is critical, honestly. This, this is something, and I think that it's such an individual or personal definition in terms of you, you kind of do need to sit with this and determine what fuels you. So I'm an introvert. At this setting, I love, I love coming on and I love sharing, but this, this something like this may drain me slightly. So I'm going straight to bed after this. However, um, you have to know what works for you. So I love quiet time. When I first got married, my husband asked me if something, if he did something to me and I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I go on the patio and I sit down and I journal and I write, I read, I listen to music. Those are all the things that fuel me. I think it's so important to determine what fuels you, what works for you. Maybe something like a, a prayer partner or something like that you like and that, you know, having that one-on-one -on -one discussion, maybe it's a group discussion. Maybe that lights you up. But whatever energizes and fuels you is important to know for yourself what works because that is, I, I love that point because, you know, I, I think I said it before, you cannot run on empty. You cannot, you cannot fulfill your purpose on empty. 
Um, and I know we talk a lot about legacy and we talk a lot about purpose and some people get intimidated by that. And what I'll say to you, quite honestly, is for me, it was a journey to figure out where I kind of slotted in. And when I figured out that I slot in multiple places, even that was a little confusing, but I landed on, I'm an executive coach and I still love my finance side. I thought I had, I thought I hated finance until I did it on my own. I thought I grew to a point that I just disliked it. But when I realized that I was able to structure it how I wanted, I was like, this is cool and I'm really good at this. Um, but I also love my other passion, which is coaching and, and teaching people personal growth. So what I would say is if you, if you don't know, if you feel like legacy or purpose are two words that you're like, well, I don't even know. That's so important to just kind of sit with it and just try one thing and then see how that feels. And if that doesn't quite hit it, then try something else. My thing is you can't sit and pray and hope that it will just appear or fall into your lap. You have to look in different avenues that touch your heart that are interesting that you feel passionate about sometimes it's actually even looking at something that annoys you <laughs> like I don't like inefficiency and it guess what I actually like to design processes for efficiency now so I flip that script but sometimes we we get you know a bit lost as well I don't know what legacy and I don't know what purpose but I would encourage you that that's such an important area to just sit with um, and Sasha, um, you know, Sasha and I, well, she gave me an opportunity to share with some teenagers. When was that? Not last year, a year before. We had about 70 teenagers that we took through a program called Play Like a Girl, um, all about passion and vision. And, and it's, you know, it's asking yourself some of those deep questions um, and figuring out what, what, what really gets you going kind of thing and why you're here. So not to intimidate you but yes it should be it's so much easier when you when you spend the time um focusing on those things and discovering what they are for you um david doc what how important is it to renew and renewing yourself absolutely i think it's necessary it's super 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 important and you must know when that time is upon you because you know you must take care of you take care of self so you can be your better you and be, and be, it's like adding value more over and over so you, so you bring more value to others. So it, it, you know, it's taking time off, knowing what you need, when you need it and ensure you have enough of it always. So I think, so I agree with Rachel hundred percent, you know, knowing what fuels you, you know, what encourages you and what you need so you can be your better self. Yeah, it is absolutely important. Stop at a gas station, wherever it is, might be a church, might be a restaurant, might be a book, might be a music, stop and get fuel. I would quickly add one sentence maybe. The best of potential that we can have, the best of intentions, the best uh, legacy that's before us is brought at risk if we don't care for ourselves, if we don't live long enough to fulfill it, if we don't. And so caring for self, as both speakers said before, absolutely important. And whatever you need to do to ensure that you bring longevity to your life and to ensure that you refill every time so you can give more meaningfully and purposefully, do it and go right ahead. Nice. Yeah. So we're just shy about 10 minutes to the end of time. So before we jump into shifting our time, which is um, about five minutes we're gonna to use to prepare for the next two weeks, we have another question from the chat. Can you get it perfectly right? Or is it a constant refinement of the ability to manage? Our response to this question may be, oh, your response to this question may be helpful with some of the guilt trips. So can we get it right? Or is it a constant refinement of our ability to manage? David, I'm going to come to you first. Now, I would want to approach it from a psychological point of view. As we grow, as we mature, things, different things become differently important at different times. The teenager has some things that are different, that are of extreme importance. The person who's 24 has a different focus. The person who is 35, the person who is 40. And as you grow, you shift between those developmental stages with different developmental tasks becoming a lot more important. 
as you, you may have children, you may have families, and all of these things shift into different degrees of importance. And so nothing is wrong if as you grow, some of those things shift into more important places. And so greater priority is given to them. And it would mean refining your time. The things you spent a lot more time doing 10 years ago, you may not necessarily be doing the same thing here based on where you are positioned, what your life tasks are, the developmental tasks and stages you're in. And so feel free and understand that there's gonna be constant refinement as you grow mm -hmm. and as you experience and you develop across the lifespan. And that'll be my contribution to, to the question. But the commitment rather, the commitment to self-searching and being in contact with self and aware of self and responding in commitment to that is gonna be a constant. Doc? I agree with you. And I also think uh, based on Pastor Henry's question before, once we have an early understanding of, of, of legacy, I think over a period, you'll be able to measure how close you are and how, you know, what else you have to do. So, that, so it's, a, it's a learning experience because we get to see, you know, how we can measure and make some evaluation of where we are and to see if we have to do less or, or if we have to do more. So I think it's a learning experience, yes. Okay, and Doc, I'm gonna come right back to you. Nehemiah posed the, posed the question and David and Rachel, feel free. I love it. Can we hear Dr. Samuel talk about the concept of waiting on God? Is this a valid, <laughs> is this a valid Christian concept or cop out for Christians? No, it's, it's valid because um, waiting on God is necessary because um, he's the source of our life. I mean, you know, we need a direction, we need insight. Revelation is an ongoing, unfolding, unveiling where God continues to reveal and unfold and things get clearer and lighter and better. And we have a, an idea of how to navigate where we are. But waiting is not just sitting in a chair hoping for something to happen, it's an active participating. So you're waiting and you're actively you know, responding and trying to understand what do you require of me? You know, And um, I'm destined to be at this place you predicted in your predestination that this is the, the course I must take then I have to know how do I reach for those things. And sometimes reaching is not just my understanding of what I should do, but in waiting, I can hear how he wants me to respond and what you know, I'm, I'm required to give. So it is not a myth, it's necessary, and it is what God, that's how we learn um, in conversation. Just like in conversation, you know, we ask a question and we wait for a response, and then when we get an answer, we move forward. So waiting on God is also seeking for direction. And, and, and then we know our path is made clear uh, because as we wait, he informs us. And as he informs us, we take our steps in the direction that he's leading us. You know, and we know we're guided by him and we're empowered by him. So waiting empowers us and it guides us and it prepares us into the destiny we are called for. David or Rachel, you want to add to this before we move on? I, I totally agree and support, um, Bishop, only to say that waiting on God is not inaction. Right. I want to make sure we understand that, but it's walking in a particular way in conformity to what he says. And for me, that's what waiting is more than somebody getting there to sit down and... In a chair. <laughs> mm -hmm. Coaching is very action oriented, um, but at the same time, it is also learning to be still and, and listen um, intuitively and to be guided in terms of what's next. The other thing that came to mind when um, Rev was talking was don't despise small beginnings. And I say that because I was told that by someone and, and I, I had to look at it in a whole new light. And I said, you know what, what do I have in my hand right now to work with? Because sometimes we're looking so far ahead that we think we have to get to that place right now. What do you have right now that you're working with? And, and actioning and doing that while waiting on God to open more avenues or doors. But what, what are you working with right now? And I don't mean working in the sense of, you know, career necessarily. It's what do you have in your hands? What are some of the desires? What are you specifically seeking for and what what is he given you to work with now until the next step um, opens or is revealed 
That's what I would say to that. And if I must say again, in waiting, because I, I think the psalm says, as we wait upon the Lord, he renews our strength. Yeah. We're able to run and not get weary, we're able to walk and not faint. So we are renewed, we are refueled, and we are guided, and we are empowered to do the things we weren't capable of doing by ourselves. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to say something regarding perfectionism. Yes, go ahead. And the whole guilt, because I think that's really important too. And do we get it right all the time? No. Um, do emergencies or things come up that cannot be avoided? Yes. But it doesn't mean that you sit down after and go, gosh, I failed another day. I just can't get this time thing right. To me, you're still being a victim to time. Yeah. And something comes up, it's not to be guilty about, well, I didn't achieve whatever. Something came out and you needed to deal with it. You're given the grace to deal with the situation, the ability to deal with the situation. You give thanks that you can help in the situation. And then you reassess, okay, what do I need now to tweak to kind of stay back on target? What I would say is if you find yourself perpetually in a state that you are constantly and notice a trend um, that it, it's, it's a trend of, well, I just didn't get to this today and this came up and the next came up. I would say to step back and say, hold on, <laughs> is something going on here? But if you have things that come up naturally, it is not to beat yourself over the head and, 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 and approach time in that manner. Because again, you know, things happen, life happens and you deal with it, but it's not to say that you're so stringent that a life event, um, then you feel a, a lot of guilt around, because I don't think that that is um, healthy either. <laughs> Fantastic. So guys, keep your questions coming if you have to. We have about four minutes, and so we're going to wrap up now in preparation for time management part two which happens in two weeks um, we're not going to just stay here we kind of did the quote-unquote theoretical the conceptualizing the demystifying etc but we really want to spend some time on time management because the way we spend our time re-energizes engages fuels us not just to live our lives but to share the good news right the gospel of christ and that's what we're hoping to assist participants with how we build Chatapu families one brick at a time but in the same time how are we being um, news bearers to others who say they look on our lives and say oh my gosh how did you get through this or how did you cope with this and and we say it's not just with the practical tools but with God by by our side so I just posted something in the chat where does our time go it's a, a file that we're asking you to download um we're going to give you a quotation and then Rachel is going to give us some instructions as we prepare for the next session. So Carl Sandberg, he's an American writer and editor, posits that time is the coin of your life. It is the only coin you have and only you can determine how it will be spent. Be careful lest you let other people spend it for you. So in an effort to shift our time management skills, we want to address some of those challenges um, with how we spend our time. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel to explain what she wants us to do with this time sheet over the next two weeks, or over the next day, and then we will wrap up this evening segment in preparation for the next two weeks. Over to you, Rachel. Okay. Um, I think my connection was unstable for a second there. Um, this is going to be a really useful tool just to bring awareness around time. Um, so spreadsheet really just kind of looks at your day. You can choose to do it in 15 minute segments or you can choose. Rachel, are you still there? Okay, so can everybody else hear me? Rachel, are you still there? Dropped off. I am. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Let me hear you now. <laughs> can you Rachel? see me? Can you hear me? I, we can see you and we can hear you. Oh, okay, okay, good. <laughs> 
yes, the, the internet timing is just so fantastic. <laughs> right, so what I was saying is I found a really effective tool really just to bring up for doing this myself. Um, and thinking, you know, I had a person who was spending money Okay, we seem to have lost Rachel for a brief moment again. Uh, Vivette, you had a question you wanted to ask while we wait on Rachel to get back on the call. Okay, um, I want to go back to something that Dr. Samuel said, um, that sometimes you will have your assisting persons, but you are so caught up in assisting them achieving what they're supposed to achieve, and then you, you, know, you are not able to do what you're supposed to do. And while I agree with that, um, there are times, however, that when we have an assignment or we have a task to do in, in managing our time, we also need somebody else's time. Say, for example, we have an a, a task to do, um, say, until 12 o'clock. We need an approval, but we need somebody else's time um, for that approval. And so in in accomplishing our assignment and accomplishing our task, we must remember that we also need persons to assist us in doing that. And oftentimes God will place people in our lives and we might see that, see them as maybe being a bother, seeing them as being, you know, whatever it is. And we are so focused on what is it that we have to do, not realizing that we also need somebody to help us to accomplish what is it that we have, that task, that assignment um, that we have to do. So don't let us not get too, and I don't want to sound controversial, but let us not get too into ourselves. Sometimes we get into ourselves because we have this to do and we must do it. And, you know, and um, somebody else is, um, somebody else might be too much for us or whatever the case may be, but um, we need people to, help us even in, in managing our time we still need people to help us to achieve what is it that we want to achieve and we are using their time as well okay yes. why are we waiting are we? This gather are this? We? i agree with you but i think um you know it's not it's not about self exactly. it's not about self let me say that first and foremost i think what this is attempting to do is get people to rethink our use of time and to maximize how we use time the most. So, you know, that's why we started with mindsets. I don't have enough time and I can't do this and I can't do that. And the reason why we can't do that is because we're allowing other people to spend time for us. And so we're not saying, you know, at the, the expense of everyone else, just focus on self because that's not what we're called to do as Christians. So that cannot be our message. Um, the idea is that we also cannot sacrifice self for things that are not purpose driven or not a part of our purpose. So God has placed each and every one of us here for a particular reason. Yes, sharing the good news as God is, is, is priority, et cetera. Um, but in the midst of family life, for example, um, you have to decide, you know, is my work most important? Is family most important? Is God most important? And sometimes we do have to be able to say no to other people, but we definitely take your point that it's, it's not about just centering self at the detriment to everyone else. And so that's why we talk about balance a lot of the time and making sure we have a balance in how we approach everything that we do. Um, David, Rachel, Rev, um, thanks, Dr. Sasha. Uh, Dr. Sasha, thank you. But I, I, I'm happy that you mentioned that because um, I, I was leaving um, with that impression that it was about self, um, that it is so oh, self-focused and so self-driven. Um, mm -hmm. that, is, that is one of the things that the nuggets I was leaving with and I wasn't sitting so well with me. Uh, and and I'm, we are open to you raising those concerns. Don't ever leave here thinking this is where the program is, is going, which is why we always say comment in the chat, raise your hand, ask a question if something is unclear. And that is not the intention at all. Quite the contrary. It is about time management and how we manage 
our time to ensure that not just we get the best use of it, but that, you know, our families are prioritized, that God is prioritized, that we get off that, that, um, hamster wheel and that we make the best use of the time that's given to us but there's, there's no way intended for us to just say it's all about me and forget everyone else because we're not in this life together we we need community we need our camaraderie we need the church we need people and we have to plan our lives in a way that enable us to run the race and run the race well you know, Irma Bombeck says that when she stands before God, she wants to be able to say, I used everything you gave me, not in service to self, but in service to God and in service to others. So um, I, I think David wanted to, to comment. No, um, I, I want to jump in on what Vivette raised because a person who is properly self-developed will come to a place where you recognize beyond dependence like a child, the independence like a young adult, there is interdependence. And, and so people matter. And in fact, the greatest part of our fulfillment we've come to realize will center around people and particularly so as Christians. And if we miss that, it means probably we've, we've missed it. But in doing that, in doing that people focus, it must be still focused for me. I might not be driven to help everybody in the bank, as well as everybody in schools, as well as everybody in universities, as everybody, you know, I may have a particular place where my heart feels. I might be one who likes to be in education or one who likes to be in finance and coaching or one who likes to be um, in sport, um, but people will still be the focus, but it must be my reflection, my understanding, my um, appreciation of how I serve people how I relate to people, what's important, because I can't block every single people concern there is across the spectrum. That's going to drive me crazy, and that's going to make me a certain candidate for a victim of time, if you understand what I'm saying. So you're correct, but we still want to make sure we know it and, and, and put it in our self-context. I hope that brought some balance to what you were raising there. Yeah, thank you for it, though. And then just, just to add a little bit, it's, you know, I think we're all in service fields. And um, so I just see sometimes, you know, to have this, it's, it's about creating some boundaries um, that really help you to help those that you're here to serve. And so it's, you know, I may not take a call after eight o'clock. Um, and that may just be a boundary for me because I need to spend time with family and so on. If it's an emergency, that's different, but it's not saying, you can't say yes to every single um, thing. It's, it's creating some boundaries that, that keep life, keeps life healthy for you as well in, in your own preservation as well, while serving others. But um, just to make sure, uh, I, hope, I, hope, I hope, just not, just to be clear, when I said, um, you know, people's importance. I'm not. Uh, I was not referring that we ignore people and not consider. But I'm just just making sure that, that we understood that in relating to other people, we should also be aware of uh, of, of what we are called to do. So, so I hope I didn't make that cause any misunderstanding in your mind when I said that. But that's not what I meant in terms of serving self. Yes, yes, with that. Yeah, yeah. So I think we corrected that and, and inter we had some internet challenges with Rachel. So now we have- yes, perfect time. timing, right? Now we're a few minutes <laughs> over oh, time. Yeah, so, <laughs> so Rachel, give us the instructions for next week as quickly as you can. Okay, I'm gonna talk really, really quickly. So I just found that this was a really useful tool. Um, and when I used it myself, um, how I thought I was spending my time um, in some cases was not actually what was happening. Um, so it's just a good little tool to create an awareness. Um, what I would encourage you to do, I have some of the times in 15 minute segments and that may be a bit much for people, but it's your choice. You could do it in a half an hour segment, just really to bring awareness to where you're spending your time. Because when you start to put pen up, if you know, it's like when a trainer says, jot down your meals and you're like, I don't eat bad and then you're like oh shoot I can't I, I don't want to record this chocolate here so you it's just really bringing awareness it's not 
pressure, but it's just helping you see, oh, okay, I thought I was spending 20% of my time on this and really and truly I'm spending 50% of my time doing this. The other thing that I just love um, is I have two little things off the side, five things I'm grateful for. I just think that that's such a powerful way to start a day, um, to bring focus and to just give gratitude. Um, and so I just put that there because I think that's a, a lovely way to start the day, to, to just think of five things you're grateful for. And then maybe think of top three top goals that you may have for a specific day. Um, and then kind of just watch how, um, you know, a trend may happen that you're like, okay, now that I've actually jotted down these three goals, it helps me focus in more. And you just start to see what can happen. I would encourage you to do it for a week um, and kind of jot down some insights that you get from the exercise. Like, oh, I, I really don't like looking at my time <laughs> or I thought I was spending it differently or, you know what, I'm actually not doing so bad. I'm, I'm actually fairly on track because I have certain methodologies that I use and that may help other people as well. So I think it's just a really good little exercise to go through. Um, and what I would love then for the next time we meet is to have some idea of things that you're struggling with in terms of things that you may like to do or that you would like to spend the time on that you're having some trouble around. So I'll just give a quick example. Let's say that it's on your heart that you really like to do writing and you're just not getting to it. Um, what I would like you to walk away from the next section is session is like a, a bit of an action plan on how you are actually going to structure it into your time. So maybe it's spending more time with family and we're going to do like an active session where you can sit down and think through, we can talk through um, what that would look like and how you could actually create some action steps and break it down into smaller chunks that are more manageable as well. Fantastic. So in the last two minutes, we're going to wrap up. David, we're going to come to you. Final thoughts on time management. Right. So let me say, I think a proper sense of self, a proper concept of self, a direction, a purpose, um, all of these things and, and self-awareness, they, they form the basis for spending your time. If you spend time outside of that, you run the risk of just doing an academic exercise of balancing minutes and seconds and all of that. But if your life's purpose and your legacy and all of these things are put into perspective, then you align all of your time allocation and spending to that. And you'd be well um, on your way to managing time effectively together with the skills that um, Rachel just talked about. These little things will put you in good line to manage time effectively, meaningfully, and to live and not just exist and die without knowing why. Rachel. Gosh, um, live, love, and enjoy life, and <laughs> and and be aware of your time doing it. We're here for a short time on this earth. Um, we never know um, how much time we have, and I think we just need to learn to appreciate every moment, um, but also be, you know, be aware and mindful of 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 the time that we have. Spend right. it wisely. <laughs> right. I would say, you know, whatever you give your time to make sure it is setting up an opportunity for a better tomorrow and a greater future, something that you can, that you can look forward to. So, you know, give yourself um, to, to things that are meaningful and productive. Yeah. Pastor Henry, any parting words from you? Your, your mic. Your mic. Uh... My parting words, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Pleasant night and the great program. Look forward to you guys uh, carrying on next two weeks, uh, but you're going to have to do a better job at managing your time. <laughs> <laughs> 18 minutes over. <laughs> Good night, everyone. We good see night, you good night, good night, good night. Another session of Real Talk Family Life, building shatterproof families one brick at a time. God bless. Good, good.